Hey guys, welcome back to What the Fat. I have an amazing guest on today, someone that I recently uh, met and saw his talk at Paleo FX, and that's what really attracted me. And I was like, you know what? This guy knows exactly what he's talking about. Brilliant, brilliant mind. And that is Dr. Will Cole. Uh, how are you doing today? Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. And so we have a lot to talk about. Uh, he's very interesting. You're all over the place. I see you talking at so many different conferences. You're traveling all over the world. And it's, it's amazing to see someone that's practicing and preaching uh, a lot of what you're talking about. I'm excited to share with, with the audience a little bit of your perspective and some of the stuff that you've done to date. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Hey, I live and breathe this stuff. So I, I, uh, Hey, you're traveling just as much as I am, I think, though. <laughs> We're trying. You know, we haven't we haven't crossed paths yet. Yeah. Uh, only yeah. at Paleo FX. So yeah. that's honestly where I first I first saw your talk uh, at Paleo FX. I was like, man, like I've heard of you. Like I saw you on social media, and then you gave this like stellar talk at, at Paleo FX, and I was like, damn, like I need to get this guy on the podcast. And then we've just yeah. we've kept in touch on social media. So. Uh, it's just it's just been amazing, man. But could could yeah. you could you tell can you just give a little bit of background, like how you got started, kind of what got you into doing what you're doing uh, to yeah, the audience? For sure. So I am a functional medicine practitioner. Um, yeah. So a back like a professional background. My doctorate is from Southern California University of Health Sciences. Uh, it's sort of this integrative school where there's where MDs and DCs and LACs and naturopaths all kind of are there learning different modalities there, to, wanting to help people. And um, I came, came to functional medicine through uh, then because um, I heard of a guy called Tatis Karazian, who even today is one of the kind of forefathers of functional medicine. He teaches for the Institute for Functional Medicine. Um, and that was 13 some years ago. Uh, so I've not looked back uh, since. And now about 90% of my patients or more really at this point are virtual or via a webcam consult like this. So I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but most of my patients I never get to see face to face. So it's kind of a surreal, weird time that we live in. Uh, uh, it's, uh, we're talking that way now, but it also getting people direct care wherever they're at is a really cool thing. And we've been doing it for a long time now. It's now cropping up more and more, which is great. I think it's getting people quality care wherever they're at. Um, and, but my wellness journey happened before functional medicine. I, I grew up in a family that was into wellness before it was cool before it was like instagram sexy before instagram <laughs> ever existed so like 80s and 90s like in rural pennsylvania i was the kid that was drinking like weird herbal tonics and like dirt that was supposed to have like tons of these minerals um, like friends thought I was strange like they knew at, the, at our house there was not like going to be like the frosted flakes that there was only going to be the weird sprouted grain cereal <laughs> and the milk was like this full fat like um grass-fed local farmer that we'd go to like to get it so that was my uh, origins uh, that way my perspective so I was always into health in that way but I didn't own it for myself fully uh until I was a teenager and uh, and then I knew I wanted to get in healthcare and that was kind of when my journey into healthcare and then into functional medicine came about. That's amazing man and I love yeah. the fact that you're able to reach so many different people because like you you do a lot of it virtually and I think you're helping a, a ton of people and that's funny I grew up in the complete opposite where I was eating like four bowls of frosted flakes every morning. So it's it's awesome to see someone who's like kind of come from a different background, but then yeah. now you're leading people kind of kind on that. And so uh, you have a you have a family uh, and kids. So do, are you like that with them? Like, are you, do you preach a yeah. lot of that same nutritional stuff to them? Yeah. I do, I do, up without a doubt. I, um, I, I have to be honest. I had my rebellious years too of frosted flakes. It just happened like in the time when I could make my own decisions to when I like was late, like seventeen, eighteen, and I owned it for myself. I had this like three or four year period where I was like, I want to have 
junk food because uh, I could and I had my own job and money and all of that stuff. And then, you know, you fall back on a foundation. And I think that that, that at least that was the case for me. So it's a balancing act as a parent to not be dogmatic but inform them. And I think like if you give them information that's age appropriate and age friendly and make it lighthearted and make it friendly, you don't have to make it this sort of rigorous, dogmatic shame culture, especially because I have, I have a boy and a girl, especially for my daughter. I don't want to have that be anywhere near that. So it's really what I teach my patients and what I put into Ketotarian, in my new book, is is that this grace-based way of eating, this sort of lightness that I think should be the ethos of wellness and not this dieting consciousness, which we should be getting away from. It's really about loving your body enough to nourish it with good foods. That's what I teach my patients. That's what I have in my book, but it's also what I teach my kids uh, is really, this is not about you can't have these things. This is about, okay, are you, are you worth that stuff or your value and your worth and what you've been given your health as a gift is more valuable than that junk food. That's not to say they never have sweets and like junk food and like healthier versions of that. It makes me feel better, right? <laughs> if it's an organic <laughs> treat, it makes right. it feel better. But I mean, there's less dyes and things like that. So that's good. But yeah, they still ha live life. So it's, I think it's a personal de decision for parents and that specific kid and what their own requirements are and their own personality and their own health issues that they may be going through. So I'm not putting passing judgment on any parents, but I think for me, it is there's a balancing act of living in a modern world where, yeah, they're going to be the kid that's left out. They're going to have to be. But just be, and then what I tell my kids is just because something's common doesn't make it normal. Yeah, all those kids are eating like crap now, but they're not going to. They're, we're going to pay for it one way or the other if we keep doing this. Uh, some people can get away with it for years and years. Some people can't. And it's like Russian roulette with your biochemistry and genetics at that point. So I tone it down a little bit for them. I don't make it as like uh, dire. But the reality is we know this. I mean, we know this being in health. This is just something that education and information is power. And my kids now will go into a restaurant and they know the things they can or can't have. And it's just second nature to them. It's just what they what they know is our options for them and it's not done because dad says it, it's because they know this isn't going to make them feel good if they have it that's awesome man i think yeah. uh that'll resonate with so many parents because like it's not like you're pushing it on them it's just like you're teaching them and yeah. I, I i'm certain that they'll look back in 10 15 years and they'll be like yeah. Thanks, Dad. Like, I really appreciate that because you're setting them up for success. Whereas, unfortunately, a majority of people set their kids up for failure, and they feed yeah. them on at an age, and they send them off to school with some type of lunch, and it's just like you're setting them up for failure. And then they hit a point where they're like, "Dang, this is out of control. Now I really gotta fight back against it." So yeah, absolutely. There's so much pressure on all of us in that way, but especially with parents because. They're telling you this is the amount of technology that you need. This is the amount of this is the food that you're eating, and they're going to school and looking at all this stuff. And parents just give in. They can't give in. They have to be the parent. Uh, and it's this is applies to food. It applies, in my opinion, to technology and the amount of stimulation the kids are going under. It's not good for their health. It's not good for their brains, and it's not good for their body. It just takes a certain amount of fortitude to not just go with the flow because our culture is dictating what we're doing in our families and that's not okay with me. Right. And I love that because um, it's easy, right? And that's why most people do it. It's easy to give into fast food. It's easy to, to be like, all right, they're crying or they're upset. Like let them just go watch TV or let them go out with their friends. Like it, it's, it's the difficult things that you have yeah. to, as a parent, as a friend, as a family member, you just got to be like, you know what? This is difficult, but I'm going to have a real honest conversation with you and we're going to – like you'll thank me later. Like yeah. Frank would say, right? Thank, <laughs> thank me later. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Sure. Man. Well, kudos to you. And, and um, I want to go into your journey into like finding keto. So where did that come from? Where did you first hear about it and then kind of uh, spin off and, and, and obviously we'll get into your book as well? Yeah. So, uh, like I said, I grew up in the 80s, 90s. I, uh, my natural inclination was to not to fear fat. I was raised in the, well before that, that full fat milk and 
you know, grass fed beef, you know, just natural beef. It wasn't called grass at that point, just natural beef you got from the farmer, uh, you know, or wild caught fish, Alaskan salmon. We ate a lot of that was just normal was not to fear that. So I kind of knew that growing up that that was not a bad thing. Um, I didn't and when I and then I had that weird rebellion period where I had frosted flakes and then I became a teenager. I was 17, 18 and then I. I saw, I educated myself on factory farming and CAFOs and the food supply, and I was like grossed out from it. And I was doing the well-intentioned reason, which I think most people do this, is they go more plant-based. Uh, I ended up being a vegan for 10 years of my like seven, 16, 17 to about 26, 27. Um, and I'd have eggs occasionally, but I was predominantly vegan and I would eat whole foods. It was like sprouted grains and, um, you know, legumes and that kind of stuff, but it was innately carb heavy. Uh, and I got away with it for a while. I think maybe because of my youth and my age and that's when I was doing that and I was going for real foods, which is, wasn't the worst thing in the world. Um, but just because something's better doesn't mean it's optimal. It certainly wasn't optimal for me. Um, I have autoimmune conditions on both sides of my family. I have MTHFR gene mutation, double mutation. So I wasn't utilizing B vitamins very well. I have the MTRR mutation too. So basically I wasn't utilizing B vitamins as effectively with a food supply that wasn't providing me a lot of B vitamins to begin with. And I had low iron, my gut was starting to be wrecked, um, my digestion. And I came to the point where I was like, look, is, was I eating in alignment with my biochemistry, with what my body actually needed to thrive and not just get through the day? Um, and again, was it better than the standard American diet? I, of course it was, but it wasn't optimal for me. The, so that's when I had this sort of moment of kind of shifting the way that I ate. And I, uh, that kind of happened in my mid to late 20s of going, starting to go lower carb higher fat, and then uh, bringing in other foods like grass-fed beef into my diet from a, a bioavailability standpoint, a nutrient standpoint, and wild-caught fish and these other omega fat sources too that were bioavailable. So that was kind of my journey, uh, and that's really was the the concept of Ketotarian, which is my new book that's out. It's a plant-based ketogenic book, and that's really where it came from, my own journey of seeing what works and what doesn't. And then now as a functional medicine doctor and seeing the plant-based world and the keto world and what each camp is doing right and what's doing wrong and like, look, let's bring the best of both worlds together. That's what I kind of teach about in Ketotarian that you can be plant-based keto for the plant-based world, which I have a heart for and saying you don't necessarily have to abandon your, your way of eating. Maybe you prefer not eating lots of meat. Maybe you don't do well with eating lots of meat. And I talk about the ApoE4 mutation and people with gut problems that don't do well necessarily with lots of saturated fats. And maybe they do need more plant-based uh, foods and meals into their diet. So there's a lot of reasons why someone would kind of continue to be plant-based. Uh, and that's uh, was sort of my journey into ketosis and seeing the benefits personally, but also now seeing you know thousands of patients over the years in biohacking in these certain ways for people to advance their health. Um, normally, patients come to me; they're already beyond the basics. They don't eat the standard American diet. They are beyond you know don't eat McDonald's and eat real foods. They're there, but they're still struggling with health problems. Uh, so these are difficult cases that you kind of have to dig in deeper to more of these advanced approaches to macronutrients and foods to focus on and intermittent fasting. And these are um, things that I now have to and I get to uh, really explore with patients on an individual basis. Love it. Love it, man. Yeah. And, and that's really, really interesting. And I think uh, that will resonate with a lot of people because I think a lot of people might be coming from that plant-based side of things and, and a lot of, I get a lot of questions and one of the things I'm excited to dig into is like your typical day, but mm -hmm. I get a lot of questions that from people that, that often ask like, Hey, what is, what does that look like? What, what would I eat and things like that? But before we get into that, what is uh, your favorite part about like keto, not for, for you and then for your patients as well. Like um, a lot of times like 
people notice like appetite suppression and, and they just feel better. What have you noticed and with some mm -hmm. of your patients as well? For me, and it's this is a for me thing, and it's also for my patient thing. Most of my patients are on what we call, what I call it, is the autoimmune inflammation spectrum. They may they maybe have an autoimmune disease, and they're diagnosable, or they're having this inflammatory response in their body. They have maybe some autoimmune signs, but they're not bad enough to be with a full-blown autoimmune disease. They're in this autoimmune reactivity, which is this sort of stage two on this autoimmune continuum. Um, so. One of my favorite clinical applications and benefits of ketosis is the anti-inflammatory impact that beta-hydroxybutyrate has on our bodies. The fact that it really calms this inflammatory storm, so it down-regulates these pro-inflammatory cytokines, and it balances the immune system by activating the NRF2 pathway, the AMPK pathway. So I've, that's like my favorite stuff because... I see it on labs and I get geeked out about like the fact that these CRPs are improving, homocysteine's improving, they're feeling better, they're feeling less inflamed, and that's systemically, but also in the brain too. So I love the, the, the brain inflammation calming in the brain specifically. So that's my top benefit that I love for ketosis for myself and for my patients. Love that. You know, that's it's really interesting because a lot of people immediately go to the the fat loss or they go to like <laughs> the feeling of fullness. But like you bring up a really interesting point and I think I was having this conversation with someone earlier about I think a lot of people live in a state of chronic inflammation and mm -hmm. for them they think that that's normal and it's not until they remove that and then they realize whoa that wasn't normal that was an impaired state and they're like yeah I'm a completely new person and I'm sure you get that all the time all for the time. sure it's relative I mean is that the people are used to living feeling a certain way for years they just think that's normal but again just because something's common does it make it normal and then they look around at other people and they see other people feeling just as lousy as they are and they think oh it's just normal part of aging or it's just normal part of living in a modern life i'm just stressed but the reality is people settle for feeling lousy and they think it's normal so true so true and so with your practice like if you had to define like your why and and why you do what you do um reaching out to these patients what would you say that clearly you're here to try and uh, get across a powerful message and help these people who, who really need help. Um, what's your why in doing what you do? Uh, it's a sacred responsibility to be a part of someone's health journey. And I take that immensely seriously. We start off our morning uh, as a team here at the office, looking over the schedule and honestly praying over each person and saying, how can we be there for somebody where they're, where they're needed? Because I don't take that lightly. These are people that have gone through a lot. They have a pile of labs and they've seen a lot of brilliant doctors and I don't want to waste their time. I don't want to add to the pile of labs just for the sake of it. I don't want to waste the time during the consultation. So the, I'm the whole like responsibility that I, I have that I, I carry when I go into that consultation online or in person in Pittsburgh, it, it's me. My why is is wanting to deal with their issues so they can move on with their life and not be this other doctor to add to your pile of doctors that haven't given you solutions. So I, it's and I believe that health is a gift and it's a gift that a lot of time people take advantage take for granted um, until they don't have it. And uh, my patients, most of them are going through a lot of stuff and they uh, don't take that for granted anymore because they've lost it, lost it. So it's that seeing that fine line between health and unhealth is is another one. It's just like a sobering experience to see what people can lose and how easily they lost it. I mean, there's just normal people like you and I and that they're going through these health issues. So I, I think I'm constantly, my why is constantly I'm reminded of it because I'm talking to people on the ground seeing these issues so that keeps me real to that sense where it's beyond talking points and beyond uh, social media it's like okay let's this is actually making a positive impact in someone's life and the world mean needs more doctors like you out there <laughs> brother I, Thanks, I I love that and I think uh, so many more people get frustrated with with 
especially in the keto community, so many people get frustrated because their doctors aren't there to support them. But like, you're the complete opposite. Like, not only are you supportive, you're like, I'm pouring everything I got into you. And we're going to make this happen together. And, and I love that. And I think I wish more doctors were like that, man. I think the world that world and everyone's health would be in a completely different uh, situation. That were the case. I agree. I think that, and it's not just me, it, functional medicine, I think, hopefully is bringing that to people more and more. Um, and obviously, with even in our field of functional medicine, there are different personalities, um, for sure. But I think as a profession, we are doing a lot of cool things. Uh, and we're infiltrating in a good way, uh, standard model of care and private practice and telehealth and all this stuff. I mean, the Cleveland Clinic has a functional medicine center. This is where a decade ago wouldn't have been the case. So I think we're on the cusp of some awesome things uh, within healthcare. Awesome, man. I love it. And so I want to switch gears and, and give people a little insight into your life. And so if you had to describe what does a day in the life look like for, for Dr. Will Cole, like, like, uh, talk about it from like, we can start with your morning routine. Like, do you have a morning yeah. routine when you get up in the morning and what's that like? Yeah. So I wake up, uh, naturally I wake up, I start my day off by waking up and then I, I normally, I'm like not, I'm pretty simple in the morning cause I intermittent fast throughout the week. So I don't worry about food in the morning. I'm not hungry. I like fasting in the morning. I enjoy it. It's it's like a really cleansing, like centering state to not have to worry about food and digesting that early in the morning. So I'm using my energy actually to to set the seed for the day actually. So I'm normally like the practical stuff, the boring stuff of like letting the dogs out and like feeding the dogs and that kind of stuff. And normally I'm my family is still sleeping when I leave. So I go, I drive to the clinic and that's when I set the intention for the day for the with the team and we I said we go over the schedule we're kind of setting the intention of how we can be there for each patient on the the, the roster for the day um, and then I hit the ground running and I'm standing at this at my standing desk I'm sitting now actually but I'm normally standing here with it raised up uh, I'm consulting people all day long and looking at their labs and that's what I'm doing work-wise no so I will fast until lunch and then uh, at lunch, I'll have some plant-based keto option um, where, you know, in, in Ketotarian, in the book, a lot of the recipes in there are things that I would more or less, I've made them prettier for the book, but <laughs> mine are less prettier at home. Uh, but basically, it was like a, a pesto a zoodle bowl with like zucchini um, noodles. Uh, with a lot of olive oil and olives in there uh, and um, like an egg avocado, like an egg avocado, I'll probably have that at lunch. And then at dinner, I'll normally have like um, like a tuna, albacore tuna salad with avocados, something like that in the evening. So that's my lunch and dinner. I'm eating until satiety. I'm basically eating until I'm, you know, not overly full, but full. Uh, and that's pretty much my day. When I'm fasting, something that I didn't mention, when I'm intermittent fasting, I'll have Earl Grey tea, which bergamot is uh, the citrus extract, like essential oil basically in the Earl Grey tea. Uh, it's been shown to increase autophagy, which obviously you know, but, but cellular repair, cellular recycling. So I'm basically enhancing the benefits of intermittent fasting, which is autophagy being one of them, by uh, drinking the Earl Grey tea while I'm intermittent fasting. Uh, so that's something that I do that's a little weird. But other than that, I just eat real food until I'm full. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. uh, we have a fairly similar schedule. Yeah. Um, and so with a lot of the patients that you work with, do they do a lot of them incorporate in intermittent fasting as well? Yeah. So it's something that I – bring on based on what the patient needs at that moment. So it's obviously the whole thing, the whole context of functional medicine, the cornerstone of functional medicine is tailoring healthcare to the individual. But yeah, so the general rule, yeah, people, whether it's earlier or later, how much, when, that kind of stuff will vary, but definitely intermittent fasting is implemented more oftentimes than not. Love it, love it. I think that's that's a big piece and something that I think a lot of people see a ton of benefits from for sure. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. If you had to pick your favorite food, what would that be? Avocado. Avocado. 
So yeah, yeah. it's like, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Yeah. It's actually, yeah, I, 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 it's to me, it's like one of those foods that I, I, I love it. I love guacamole. I love avocado fries. I love that the, like with, the, with eggs as well. I mean, there's so many uses for it, but I love in a way to me, it like symbolizes the bridging of the keto world and the plant-based world. It's, and it's a symbol for me too. Uh, it's something that a lot of people can get behind. It's not polarizing. It's like, it's, it's connective. So I, I like it that, which is why I put it in the cover of my book too, uh, because I thought that beyond the keto world, it's something that will resonate with standard American too, as being healthy. Uh, and they don't even realize they're having a keto friendly plant food. That's amazing. And I think, um, the co the picture on the covers, it looks so good. It like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I gotta go run and grab like 18 <laughs> avocados from the store. But uh, I agree, man. You know, the crazy story about it is I used to like hate, like I said, I was the pickiest eater like growing up. I felt horrible for my parents, but like only ate cereal and chicken fingers. Like that was about it. But now like I, I missed it. I feel so bad that I missed out on my childhood of like not eating avocado and or guacamole. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what was that? What did I miss my entire life? Now I'm obsessed with it. Like yeah. absolutely obsessed. <laughs> so, it goes with so, so much, much I got stuff. My headphones. Oh, I love those <laughs> headphones. I need to find out where you got those. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Uh, what about your approach to keto? Like has it shifted over the years? Are there things – because we're constantly learning. Like we're we're always trying to upgrade and look at. Oh, cool! This new research is coming out. Has your has your approach shifted? Like, hey, this is all right. Let me incorporate this in. Like, has has that changed at all? Uh, it, it it has in some ways. I think that to me, it's it's about meeting the person where they're at and what they need for their labs to thrive. So. If I hung my hat on one way to do it, I would be proven wrong all day long seeing patients. Uh, because if it, just because it worked for me doesn't mean it's going to work for the next person. Or just because it worked for this great case, it doesn't mean it's going to work for the next great case. So that applies to macronutrients. That applies to what foods to focus on. It, 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 it applies to how long someone wants to, it should be or wants to be in ketosis. Because it's not just about even what's clinically relevant. It's also about what that patient mentally and emotionally wants to do. Because you, you, sometimes they maybe would do better with something that you're recommending, let's say ketosis, but they don't want to do it. So the stress and the irritation of having to, to do what you're telling them to do isn't good for their health either. So you kind of have to stay adaptive of what actually is the person and i'm talking about it more from like a patient doctor standpoint of just how do you make this realistic for that person on all different levels uh and even if it's just suitable to what foods they want to focus on if they hate a certain food and you're telling them like these are the foods you have to do that's not going to work there i i think there's a certain level of you're an adult like tr try these things and you may like it because a lot of times people think they don't like it they haven't touched it since they were kids like you like avocados that they just haven't given it a shot but there's some people that legitimately just don't like certain foods or it makes them gag and throw up and what are you going to do with that so you have to adapt it so i don't know if my i my opinion on ketosis and learning more about that has changed but just being okay with being open minded to the adaptive way that we can use food in, in boundless ways. Yeah, and, and you hit the nail on the head with everyone being individualized. And I think I, I put a video up the other day and someone asked a question. They're like, what percent macro should I be eating? And I'm like, there's so many that's I need more context around that because I wish it was easy. I wish I could tell every single person in the world, if you eat 75% fat, 20% protein, 5% carb, like everyone will be okay. And you eat you that like, but everyone's so different. Like yeah. some people can tolerate a higher amount. Some people need a lower amount. Like yeah. it's so individualized. So it's great that you're working with people on that like custom level. Of, hey, let's, let's figure out what works best for you. Introduce some things, eliminate some yeah. things. And that's what allows it to be sustainable. So. For sure. And then they, because a lot of times people will go through it, like uh, they'll go into it, they'll read an article online, and then they don't feel good, or they hate it. Uh, and then they think, oh, this keto thing didn't work out for me. But it's that they weren't really setting themselves up to what works for them sustainably. And 
like they're just giving it up, giving up on it too quickly for a lot of times. Uh, and they just need to personalize it and then it will work for them. For sure. For sure. Have you heard of, I saw something the other day at, I believe it was Whole Foods. Uh, and I thought of you when I saw this, um, they're called Lupini beans. Have you heard of I have, like the Lupini beans? I have beans? heard them. I heard, I have heard of them. I have not tried them, but I've heard of them. Yeah. They're, they're interesting to me. It's we. It's like they're wet inside the package. So they're kind of soft, but they got kind of got like this harder outer shell. And I think I've been seeing a lot more keto people post about them because they're seven grams of carbs, but they're seven grams of fiber. And I was like, Oh, mm. this is, this is really interesting. Um, Very cool. And they have all different kinds of flavors and stuff like that. So I was just curious. I was, I was, I've yeah. only tried them once, but I was curious if that was something that yeah. you incorporated. No, I, I haven't, but now you're, I'm going to <laughs> offer this conversation. Yeah, I will now. I will now. No, patients have asked me about them. I've looked into them. Like I've okayed them for people on a, a doctor level, but I haven't tried them myself. Awesome. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what excites you about this space? Like you, you've seen it, you've been, obviously you've been in it for a long time. You see it growing. Um, what excites you about the keto conversation? I think it's a way to uh, um, advance the conversation around food. I think that, you know, we can all get around, or most of us in this space can get around real food. I think most of us can get around um, avoiding boxed junk food. Um, most of us can get around that. And I think that that's the commonality between, you know, anyone within that real food umbrella, whether they're vegan or vegetarian or pescatarian or paleo or keto, I think that there's that commonality of real food. What I love about the ketogenic conversation that's happening in our culture right now is we're moving beyond exactly what foods to focus on, but how to use foods for fuel to enhance um, our mitochondria, enhance our brain and shift our metabolism. But to me, that's the exciting conversation that really hasn't been done in a major way. I think it's been done. It was done to a small degree with Atkins, but it was really about weight loss. What I love about the research right. coming out right now is it's so much more than weight loss, which is certainly a benefit of ketosis, but it's a benefit. What are these amazing health benefits beyond food? But how can you use food to shift Thing, pathways in your body to enhance how you feel uh, and calm inflammation, which we talked about too. Because many of these people that are eating real food are still in varying amounts of inflammation, even though they're better than they were when they eat, were eating the standard American diet. But this is a way for them to take this anti-inflammatory benefit beyond where they're at right now, move beyond that plateau. I don't think there is a food movement that's going on right now that is providing people that level of science and uh, expertise that, that that's coming out of the keto world. Completely agree, man. Completely agree. And so what tips would you have for someone or what tips do you give people just starting out? Like how, like, hey, here's what keto is and like getting started on it. What tips do you have for people? Yeah, so that was important to me in Ketotarian. I wanted because I, I like the sciencey stuff, but I realized as a teacher, really, of the person coming in and wanting to learn more about food, I needed to keep a lot. I needed to put a lot of keeping it simple options in the book. So for every every sciencey stuff, there's like a, if you just want to keep it basic you'll still get benefits from it. And sometimes that's what people need. Sometimes even the advanced smart people need to keep it simple just to like de-stress their life and to like quit overanalyzing everything about food. Um, Cause I think honestly, orthorexia is like a growing problem in our space. I think people are becoming overly um, anxious and stressed about oxalates and histamines and lectins and all this stuff where it's like we know too much for our own good, where it's now eating is not even enjoyable anymore. Uh, people are stressed about food. So I, I, I think that this even this question of what are the simple things applicable to advanced people as well. Uh, so to me, I think that when you're having the, the basics are eat when you're hungry, eat, uh, eat until you're satiated, 
uh, keep your carbs low, increase your healthy fats, and obviously uh, specific to ketotarian, which is what I wrote the book about, being plant-based keto, is when you have a non-starchy vegetable, add a healthy fat. When you have a healthy fat, add a non-starchy vegetable. I, I think those are two um, add-ons to that too. But I would, I think keeping it basic is should be the starting point for everybody. And then from there, you can lean into these other things if you need to. Some people don't need to. Some people should just be eating real food, eating into their full, and focusing on these keto-friendly foods. For sure, man. Great tips. Um, what about traveling? Obviously, you travel a lot. Like, do you fast while you travel? What are some tips for people that are traveling and then like you're in an airport? What, what are some things that you recommend to people that are, might be traveling a lot? Yeah, so I do travel a lot and I do fast typically. I normally have a morning flight anyway, so it's kind of simple uh, in that way where I'm fasting anyways. And uh, so I would say encourage more people to do that. Uh, when they are fasting, I feel like in general, it's just a, a smart thing to do. It's, with that said, you know, I have kids and I travel with my kids too. And I realize that some people have kids or have people that they just don't want to fast. So at that point, you have to come prepared. I pack my all the food that I need in my bag. I'm not going to be left to the whim of of the airport food selection for my day. Uh, and I think just living this way, I don't do that for anybody. I, I'm not expecting to find something. And that's what patients crack me up when they're like, well, there was no other choice. It's like, well, yeah, you cannot expect the world to dictate what you should be eating or not. You need to come prepared uh, or else you'll always be going something that's not you, it's sabotaging your goals, whoever, whatever goals they have. Um, the so I will pack like sea snacks, uh, like the the seaweed uh, chips because they come in like this small travel pack. So it's olive oil, seaweed, um, I, nuts and seeds uh, are something that I love. Um, Epic Bar, I, I use them a lot in there uh, when I'm traveling too. Um, canned things uh, as well, uh, and those travel sized almond butter. Uh, just plain, literally, it's just almond butter in a travel thing. I forget the, the brand name of it, but it's, um, I think it's Georgia, something like that. But anyways, there's a lot of different brands out there, but just plain almond butter in a travel size apartment. And then I do, I get foods that are slightly more smelly to like, and, and I'm thinking on the plane, they're probably, I'm probably so annoying, but I will do like the hard boiled eggs or the egg salad and um, or a tuna salad and like with my, you know, avocado oil, mayo, and I open it up and I'm realizing they're probably like, what the heck, what is going on here? I'm, I, but I have this huge Tupperware of like egg salad, but you know, that's, that's how I roll when I, when I travel and I'm not fasting or for my kids, like that's what they're eating. Really good. Really awesome. Um, yeah. what are your top go-to supplements? Uh, like, like do you take supplements daily? And if so, what are they and what's, what's, what are you using them for? Yeah, so I had mentioned a little bit ago that I have the MTHFR gene mutation. So you can have one mutation or two mutations, and there's two different main sections on that gene sing, uh, SNP that one can have one or two mutations that you typically get tested for. But I have the double mutation at the C677T location, which is the more problematic one. It's the more inhibited uh, gene function when you have that double mutation, which means my gene sucks at converting folic acid into folate, which you need to bring inflammation levels down and do a lot of cool things for your brain and your hormones and detox pathways. Uh, so I supplement with a methylated B vitamin. That's like essential for me. Uh, so it helps my inflammation levels. It helps with anxiety. It, a lot of the things that my body's not doing so well on its own, I'm basically overcompensating to mitigate the risk factors that are associated with these genetic uh, polymorphisms. Uh, and these are things that we test for patients to um, see what's relevant for them. Uh, that B vitamins, vitamin D, and uh, uh, mega fish oil. Those to me are like the three cornerstone things that I do all the time. And then from there, like I'll do a lot of adaptogens, but I'm not I'm not doing the same adaptogen every day. I'm like rotating it based on what I feel like it. And that's the fun 
of wellness. I think that if I'm feeling a certain way and I want to focus on a certain adaptation, I just I do it for fun to enhance how I feel. So like for example, like mucuna purians is this type of adaptogen that is high in uh, L-dopa, which is like a precursor to dopamine. So it's just good from a brain function standpoint. Or lion's mane, I like the the impact that the adaptogenic mushroom lion's mane has on the brain. That's not stuff that I do every day, but it's stuff that I, I just enjoy it. And I, um, I like using food as medicine in that way. Love it. Um, and just to wrap up this segment, um, I know you, I've seen you posted on Instagram a little bit about CBD, um, mm -hmm. and I, I, you're a big proponent of, of that. And can you talk a little bit about what, like, do you use isolate, full spectrum, kind of like what what your thought is and goal is with CBD? Because I see it, it's growing in popularity. Mm -hmm. I think it can work well in conjunction, especially with ketosis. But kind of just would love your insight on that as well. Yeah, that is another one that I use not every day, but I will use it when I feel like I want, I need it. So I'll use it for anxiety because I'm prone to more anxiousness. So I'll use that from a calming uh, neuroinflammation standpoint um, and for sleep. Uh, and if I'm like my, my, like I have problems with my right shoulder sometimes and that will help with the pain level too. So I use full spectrum hemp oil typically. Uh, and there's a lot of great brands out there, but yeah, it's something, Definitely something that I use personally from time to time, not on a daily basis, but I use it a lot for patients that are dealing with autoimmune issues and inflammation issues. And it can be a game changer for people uh, that are dealing with these in, uh, persistent inflammatory problems that they've done the food. They, food is always foundational. So they, they, they got that on point. But then I, I, like you said, I think that things like CBD oil, things like adaptogens can be these sort of next level tools to complement uh, uh, the icing on their keto cake, so to speak. <laughs> the keto <laughs> friendly icing. Yeah. Love it, man. That's a great segue. And, and I want to I want to go into switch gears a little bit and go into your book um, because, like we we talked a little bit before about some of the stuff that's in Ketotarian, how amazing that avocado looks on the front of the book, like. Absolutely, like I'm salivating thinking about that, <laughs> that avocado now. Like it's unbelievable. But yeah. what inspired you to write Ketotarian, and like how long did it take you? What was your thought process behind it? I, but let us know what kind of that process was like. It started off with my own journey of seeing uh, the like being a vegan for 10 years and starting having fatigue and having methylation problems on labs and my gut not doing so well. Um, so I, it was my own evolution in health and healthcare and wellness personally. And it's now really born out of seeing patients over the past decade plus of how to harness the power of food in a specific way. So I wrote it for, I wrote Ketotarian for the ketogenic eater that wants more plant-based options in their life that maybe you've tried keto, keto, the ketogenic diet and don't feel well eating lots of meat and dairy and they want they want to not throw the whole thing out and just say it's not working for me but actually give it a different give it a different vantage point um, and I wrote it for the plant-based eater that once that's reading about these or hearing about the things about ketosis, but they maybe for ethical reasons or religious reasons or just a personal preference reason, they just don't really like eating a lot of meat, they're grossed out by it, whatever reason they have, that they can uh, really um, still be in ketosis and be plant-based. Uh, this is not something it's either or, they can have both. Um, so ketotarian was, my, my intention was to have this sort of alchemy between the best of both worlds, the best of being plant-based, the best of being keto. Um, and uh, that's really what it came. And then as we both know, there's a lot of people in the standard American uh, diet world and trying to figure out what the heck to eat. Maybe they don't want to go full keto, but they just want real food options and they want to sample. Uh, they hear about being plant-based, hear about being keto, and they're like, oh, what, what should I do? Well, look, here's some options for you to eat more low carb uh, and still be plant-based, which we know is going to be way better than the standard American diet. It's really nutrient-dense foods while calming inflammation and insulin levels. So yeah, that's really why I wrote it. And um, yeah, hopefully people love it. 
Yeah, well, it's I see it's doing amazing, and, and rightfully so, because I think you did an amazing job of, of taking, like, you have a very scientific mind, but making it extremely practical, um, mm -hmm. because that's one of the things I talk about all the time is, as scientists or doctors, like, a lot of times, it's very, it's very high, like, people are like, oh, let's dig into the details and talk about NLRP3 and these inflammasomes and some of these things. And the, the main st consumer is like, I don't, I don't, that's, those are just letters in the alphabet. Like, what is that? Is yeah. it, it's either inflammation's on or inflammation's off. Like what's good, what's going on yeah. here? Um, yeah. but you did an amazing job of speaking to both. And, and I think that's a huge, huge compliment to you in, in that you did such an amazing job with that. And then also appealing to that crowd because one of the things that I first think about when I saw this, I was like, "Oh, it's gonna, this is gonna dis disrupt and get a lot of people angry." That that this whole plant-based thing, but I thought it was amazing in the sense that there are people exactly like you said it that prefer the style of eating, right? They they go this way whether it's for personal reasons, religious reasons, or like you said, just their food preferences put them more towards plant-based. But one of the things we do know is that when people typically consume a majority of their calories as plants, like a vegan um, or, or vegetarians, a lot of times they miss out on ample protein. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the things that we know about the ketogenic diet and being in a state of ketosis is that it's very muscle sparing. So for these individuals, it's a no-brainer to me, and that's why I'm super excited about it. I think it's I think it's so important that people who are like if, if you're choosing to be a vegan or vegetarian or eating mostly plants, like being in a state of ketosis can be extremely powerful, not only for all the other benefits that we've talked about, but for uh, sparing muscle and keeping on that muscle tissue because you have sarcopenia or age-related muscle loss. For people that are getting older, or kids that are growing up, trying to build uh, a, their, a good body composition, like that stuff's important. So huge kudos to you, and, and I think it's going to really help a lot of people who are eating that that way to say, hey, not only do I get a lot of these benefits, like the anti-inflammatory benefits, but at least I'm, I'm preserving and building a lot of that muscle tissue. Absolutely, yeah, it's very true, and and they're not realizing that they don't have to necessarily abandon everything they're doing. They just need to tweak and you know modify their foods to really um, achieve these benefits that people in the keto world are seeing. Absolutely. So I want to bring up two questions, um, two questions that I know you probably get all the time. And, and it's interesting, I was just on a podcast myself and we were having this conversation because oftentimes what happens, and one of our goals at like ketogenic.com, one of the things that we're doing is this conversation is so powerful. There's amazing individuals like yourself that are seeing tremendous success. We get stories and D I know you get a ton of DMs. I get a ton of DMs of people that are like, oh my gosh, you changed my life. I'm a new person because of this. And our goal at ketogenic.com is like, how do we protect this conversation? Like how do we make sure it doesn't get out of hand like the Atkins and people take it and just swing it one way or another. But um, we're, we're kind of close to in, in this keto realm where people are like, now we're battling over um, you have vegans on one side, and you have carnivore keto on the other side. You have people that are like, you can only have 80 grams of protein a day, and people that are like, just eat however much protein you want. Like, it doesn't matter. And so, like, how do we find that middle ground? And I, I like, I think you have a very similar approach of like, listen, it's what works best for you. Like, let's get back to the basics of like whole foods and stuff. But yeah. my question is, what are your thoughts? Because I've seen it explode now. Like Joe Rogan's talking about it. There's individuals like Sean Baker and a bunch of people on social media now that are talking about carnivore uh, keto. And, and a lot of them say that that's what helps them lower inflammation because they're cutting out some of the plant sources. Um, what have you have you encountered any people that have, like ask you about that, or what are your thoughts on on carnivore? Yeah, so I do get this question a lot, um, and I, I go back to that point of. Uh, it's better than the standard American diet, certainly, but is it optimal long term? I think that people that are in this space that they're already eating healthy and they want to biohack and sort of test these ways of eating, I think it's a great thing to experiment with it and to kind of see as long as it's good sourced foods and all of that stuff. Um, but that remaining, I think that you, I see the benefits of lowering lectin amounts for a while and going for them. I think that some people can do really well and see changes, positive changes in their health. Um, 
my concern long term would be for the gut microbiome. So uh, the bacteria in our gut eat what we eat. They predominantly eat fiber from plant foods. So bacterial diversity uh, is shown to be the most uh, abundant whenever somebody eats a variety of different plant foods. And uh, basically, the more diverse our microbiome, the more abundant our health is associated with it. And then the less diversity, the more health problems can ensue in theory. Uh, or predisposes somebody for this. So the one caveat is the Hadza tribe in Tanzania, uh, is that the research shows that their bacterial diversity actually increased on the months that they ate just basically predominantly meat, but they were eating more raw meat and lightly cooked meat and drinking blood and things from their animal. So unless the carnivore dieter is going to go full on Hadza, I'm concerned with bacterial diversity long term because most of these guys, you know it, they're not, they're eating the ribeye and they're eating the hamburger, which is cool and all, but it's not going to get you bacterial diversity like the Hadza. Uh, so I, that's the one caveat is the, the microbiome long term. And obviously there are some people like people with APO4 mutations, people with gut problems, sometimes they don't do well on lots of saturated fat. Their, their inflammation levels will actually spike, which is counterintuitive, but it will. And their cholesterol levels will be off. They'll go really high. The triglycerides may even go off. Again, counterintuitive, but we're all different with different genetics and different microbiome gut health statuses. So I think that's the, um, yes, I, those are not everybody, but I think that there's, uh, long term for everybody that's doing this, their microbiome uh, diversity is something I'd be thinking about. It's a great point, and it's something that I talk a lot about as well. Because, um, and I don't know, I don't think it's it's like you said, it's a, it's a, one of those unknowns of how does that affect things. And mm -hmm. we know that when you consume fiber, um, you're getting you produce butyrate, and we know the effects, the positive effects of butyrate for the gut microbiome. So. Mm -hmm. um, that was, I think that's a great way to answer and a great way to, to, to address it because a lot of times it's just like, hey, if that's working for someone like, and that's what's working well, then great. Um, but like you said, long-term impact of, of the gut microbiome is, is quite interesting and, and we really don't know it yet. And, and yeah. that biological diversity, uh, I think is, is key. Like I love, I eat Cobb salads, like they're going in a style and like, that's like main, like I love incorporating in different, different types of foods to, to try and uh, improve my gut health. Cause we know yeah. that gut health is instrumental for everything else um, yeah. as well. Um, now I'm sure you've seen this all the time or I'm sure you get emails from patients like this, this is something that just got brought up and it's crazy. It's all over the media outlets. I've gotten a million one DMs and emails about it, but uh, we know that it's not true, but uh, there's a lot of studies that, that a study that just came out showing that like the people that tend to eat lower carb tend to have higher rates of mortality. How do you handle that? Like I'm sure you get e questions and emails from patients all the time, like, oh, this article came out saying coconut oil is going to kill you, or this this came out saying eating low carb yeah. sucks. How do you handle some of that? Yeah, it's part of the job, right? We just like whatever the headlines are. To weigh in on them uh, on a patient level and social media level. Uh, the, the causation doesn't equal correlation. I think that's the, and the other way around, correlation doesn't equal causation. I think that that's really what it comes down to. You get these like huge studies that are, that are these sensational headlines, but you look at the data, it's actually not that compelling. And uh, I think there's that. I think, but within the just on a practical level, you look at just because something's high fat, low carb doesn't mean it's healthy. Uh, and you have to look at a specific with even the small umbrella of high fat, low carb. How can you optimize that? Because we know there are toxins can be stored in fat. So if they're going for all these fat, fatty foods that aren't good quality, that's not good for your health. And there's a lot of low carb things like artificial sweeteners and things like like this that I would say would increase health problems potentially too. So I, I there's a lot of aspects where yeah I think that that you have to make be specific about the foods you're having if you're going to go low carb, and that applies to any diet. Um, but I would really bring it down to the individual for the patient or the person and just saying what's your experience. How do you feel on this? What do your labs say? What's right for you? Um, so I think that's when it comes down to it. Um, that's really what I say for any 
headline that comes up. I mean, this is the most recent one, but you're right. Before that was the coconut oil. Before that, I mean, we can go on and on. There's always something coming up where you have to like put it in context with what actually the researchers were even saying. And then some news piece uh, came up with like a really interesting, amazing head a headline for everybody to click on it. Oh my gosh, yeah, the, the, you gotta love the clickbait. The best one yeah. I saw, it was funny because they actually responded back to me, but it was either the New York Post or someone and it was like, how eating pasta will save your life. And I was like, oh my gosh, like how did yeah. we get here? How do we get here? But no, I love it. And I think um, you hit the nail on the head. It's, that's that's part of what we need to do is help be that resource and, and educate people. And I think, like, I love the answer you gave on, on the cardboard topic because it's, it's super popular right now. And I think a lot of people are, are like, I, I don't like to look at it as, like, a camp because, unfortunately, it's segmented. Like, we're all trying to achieve the same outcome of, like, optimizing health and, and mm -hmm. looking at food differently. And I think... Um, but you have those people who are like hardcore and those are the people that are going to Wendy's or McDonald's removing the bun and they're like, yeah, carnivore is better than this. And I'm like, you don't even know if that's like what's in that meat. Like you, don't even, yeah. like you, you, that's the same person who like will get mad at someone for having like some sweetener and they're like, do you know what stevia could do for you? Like what can do to you? And you're like, you just ate 18 uh, patties from Wendy's. What do you mean? What do you yeah. mean? So I think yeah. you hit yeah. the nail. It's it's all about context, man. It's yeah. really the individual in context. Sure. Yeah. They they love their their sensational headlines. I remember I, I I wrote an article about high fat and how it sustains energy. It was really a lighthearted piece. It mentioned ketosis in passing, but it was really just about focusing on healthy fats. It wasn't something too uh, dogmatic. It was for Mind Body Green, and the Daily Mail actually picked it up in the UK, and they like ripped it to shreds. And then all the comments were even funnier uh, that they were <laughs> saying, "Who could afford this avocado?" And they were like making the strangest arguments just to be negative for the sake of it. So I mean, the, our media is pretty insane to like divide and create hyperbole when there shouldn't be any. Because avocados and eggs aren't that radical. <laughs> it's crazy, man. You never know. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. No, I, I love it. Um, it's, it's good that there's people like you in this world to, to help sift through the noise, right? You gotta, yeah. you gotta be able to sift through the noise. Um, yeah. Like wrapping this up, what are your three top, um, I would say benefits. We talked, well one you already mentioned, is like the anti-inflammatory component. And I think that's whole body, brain and physical. Um, for benefits that you tell uh, people about with keto, what are two others that you, you talk to a lot of patients about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, Amongst the inflammation topic, uh, the antioxidant pathways, I'm lumping those in with with the inflammation levels. I just think there's so many cool things as far as inflammation balancing and antioxidant pathways that I like. Um, so I would put that all together, uh, even though there's, pro there's like probably 10 different pathways that I think are pretty cool there. But I think beyond inflammation and immune modulation, Along the lines, but I'll make it separate, is the modulatory impact that the ketogenic diet has been shown to have on the microbiome uh, as a causation rule for people with seizures and people with brain problems. Uh, so the uh, positive impact that it has on the mi gut microbiome, I think, is really interesting. And thirdly, uh, it would be mitochondrial biogenesis, so the impact that it has on the mitochondria. So I think those, to me, are the three most compelling uh, mechanisms that ketosis has on our physiology and this this the what those three things can do uh, for the human race today uh, improving gut health lowering inflammation increasing mitochondrial function I mean like that's major so uh, those are those are the three things that are the most exciting for me love it man and yeah. uh, what Tell people a little bit about what they can find in Ketotarian. Like you have amazing recipes. Um, what else kind of compiles the book? What else you got in there? So half of the book is ethos and like science and functional medicine sort of uh, perspective on the inflammation spectrum and the benefits and the pitfalls of ketosis and the benefits and pitfalls of being plant-based. Um, so that's all the first half of the book. And the second half of the book is recipes. There's over 81 different recipes, 
pretty pictures, uh, meal plans, practical stuff, like application stuff. So manifesto to manifested was the first and the second half of the book. Uh, and there are vegan keto options. There's vegetarian keto options. We bring uh, eggs and ghee in. And then there's pescatarian keto options, uh, what I call in the book vegetarian. So it's still plant-based, but it's uh, wild-caught fish and shellfish and all of that. So someone can be one, just vegan ve uh, keto, or they can mix and match, which is what I am um, hopefully educating the, the reader in the book to consider uh, from a bioavailability standpoint of omega fats, micronutrients, B vitamins. So those are the things that I'd like to recalibrate the plant-based world at least some of them, and then recalibrate the keto world. So that's really the, the book in and of itself. It's amazing, man. And I think um, I get, so we get so many questions. We do Instagram lives and Facebook lives all the time. And your book is like the number one resource like, I'm excited for it to officially launch because I'm Thanks. like, just wait. I'm going to have them on the podcast. It's coming soon because there are so many people who are vegan or are vegetarian or looking for more plant based options. And like, they don't, they don't, a lot of them, a lot of the stuff out there now doesn't really cater to that. So I think it's really amazing that you put together this this great resource uh, for a lot of people, and I, I know it's it's going to help and affect uh, a lot of people around the world. So, Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. So uh, in closing, where can people find you? Are you you're like when you're when you're not traveling the world, you're you're always on you're on Instagram at least. So so people can find <laughs> you on Instagram. Where uh, where else can they yeah. find you? Yeah, so I'm everything's at drwillcole.com, and I'm with patients during the week. So um, traveling's on the weekend, so I'm normally <laughs> here. Uh, the yeah, so everything's at drwillcole.com. That's w r w i l l c o l e dot com, and that's my same handle for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Awesome, and the book is available on Amazon. Where else? Yes, it's on. Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, anywhere books are sold. At the at drwillcole.com, there's a lot of extra stuff they can get to, and the links to Amazon and everything are at the website too. Amazing, man. Well, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it, and and you're doing amazing things for the world, and I I hope that so many people take a lot away from this episode, but realize that. There are amazing functional medicine doctors out in the world, and, and you're leading that charge. And, and really, from what we're trying to do with, with ketogiant.com is bringing people together and telling amazing people like yourself stories out to the masses because the world deserves to hear it. With all the nonsense and noise that's going on in the social media world, there's mm -hmm. tenfold more good. And, and so thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're doing the same. I'm, I'm really honored to be on the show. Thanks so much. Absolutely.